Welcome back into the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap. Sap, today is my birthday, but my beloved Boston Celtics did not give me much of a birthday present last night as uh, they put up a stinker losing game one to the Miami Heat, 107 to 118. And it was pretty much a product of one of the worst quarters of basketball you will ever see, the third quarter, which has been uh, a thorn in the Celtics side for a while now. Um, as they are outscored 39 to 14 in that quarter and, and lose game one. Um, and they were undermanned in that game. No Al Horford, uh, no Marcus Smart, but you just, you can't, Miami is, is too smart of a team sap to be able to just spot them a game or a quarter like that. Yeah. I mean, the Celtics played pretty well in the first half. I thought they could have had a bigger lead at halftime. They were only up eight. They had been up by 13 and when they were up only eight, I didn't feel real confident because it should have been somewhere around 15 or 16. The way they had played, I thought they'd have a bigger lead, but Miami just stayed in there. And then the third quarter happened. Like you said, you had 39 to 14 outscored by 25 points, which almost doesn't seem possible. Cause if you extrapolate that for an entire game, that means you lose by 100 points. Um, right. <laughs> you know, saw scores like that when Cheryl Miller was dominating in high school, like not the NBA game one in the Eastern conference finals, the Celtics did everything wrong. They were two of 15 from the floor. They had eight turnovers. Jason Tatum had six turnovers in the quarter. Like again, that those are numbers that don't even seem possible. And then Miami took advantage of that, which they do. And then they sailed in from there. So it's one, nothing heat. But uh, as I say all the time, uh, it may be a cliche, but this is not the tour de France. It's one, nothing Miami, whether they won in blowout fashion, which an 11 point win is not really blowout fashion, but the fourth quarter was just pretty much, you know, a formality, but it's one game to nothing. So the Celtics have to come up with a much better effort in game two, or they come back home over the weekend down two games to nothing against a team that we both saw going into this as a really tough nut to crack because they are physical. They are very, very smart. They're a veteran team led by Jimmy Butler, who's playing out of his mind right now. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, except they, I'm looking at the box score right now, they had 12 blocks last night. Miami, that's crazy. I mean, 12 blocks as a team is uh, – the Celtics just couldn't figure it out in the second half against them. And uh, what frustrated me, Sap, was that the Celtics, they've been so resilient for the second half of the season, but in that quarter they just quit. Um, mm-hmm. Just absolutely, once Miami went on a run, the Celtics quit in, and just were being careless with the ball. It was almost like, all right, like – they, they lost the mental toughness game, and Miami is as mentally tough as a team as it comes. And, and the Celtics, uh, I mean, again, you, like you said, Sepp, they had the lead going into halftime, and the third quarter happened, and this team, for a long stretch of that quarter, just absolutely gave up and let Miami, you know, turning the ball over on every possession, it seemed like, settling for terrible jumper. It was, it was awful. It was hard to watch. It really was. From even just an aesthetic standpoint, it was hard to watch. Miami took their will away. That's what it felt like. And it was led, of course, by Jimmy Butler, who goes out for 41 points, nine rebounds, five assists, four steals, three blocks, only two turnovers. I mean, he just filled up the stat sheet. He was literally, and this again, a cliche, sorry, but it was a man among boys. He just looked like he was playing against his kids, especially when Peyton Pritchard was stuck trying to cover him. It just felt like dad in the driveway against his 12 year old. He just, you know, backed him up jumped over him and hit the 12 to 15 footers. Amazingly jet and 41 points without a three pointer. It was 0 for two from three. He's kind of like a player that seems more from like the nineties or the eighties. I mean, he doesn't really have a three point game. He isn't the most aesthetically pleasing guy to watch play, but man, is he effective and he's so competitive and he plays both ends of the floor. And, you know, we were kind of ranking who's the best player left in the playoffs. And we both think that Luca and Tatum are one, two. And I said Butler three just over Steph, the way they're playing now, not historically. Butler right now almost has the feel of Joe Flacco in 2012 when he played great in winning four playoff games, including the Super Bowl. I think he had 10 touchdown passes and zero interceptions in that four yeah, game stretch. A good run there. Yeah. Feels like Joe Flacco. Now, I think Butler is better at his craft than Flacco was at yes. his, but it has that same kind of feel like maybe things are just opening up for Jimmy Butler to win a championship because. You know, again, we talked about it that Golden State, Dallas, Boston, Miami, they're all kind of flawed teams at some point. And this guy might just be smelling it. And he just looked unbelievable last night. 
Yeah, you know, I think from the Celtics perspective, obviously, um, you 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 got to figure out how to how to limit him. But I, I do think that there are ways to to you know make sure he doesn't go over forty one. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, the big part for me and looking at it is you can't let him live at the free throw line. He's seventeen of eighteen from the free throw line. He's a great free throw shooter. And that helps out the rest of his offense. You know, he sees things go down at the free throw line. His jump shooting becomes a little bit better. Um, and I think that was really the story of, of the second half of this game. And ultimately the story of the game is that the way the Heat wanted to play and what the Heat wanted to do, the Celtics obliged in every single way. The Heat wanted to play a, a faster paced game. The Celtics said, okay, we'll play a faster paced game. The Heat struggle in half court a little bit. And so the Celtics didn't take advantage of that. Jimmy Butler wants to constantly go to the free throw line. The Celtics obliged by, you know, constantly fouling him and letting him get to the rim and, and doing that. So uh, the Heat want to live off of turnovers. The Celtics were careless with the basketball. Every <laughs> way the Heat wanted to play and everything the Heat wanted the Celtics to do, the Celtics, like I said, obliged them. They they basically played the exact type of game down to the letter that Miami wanted the Celtics to play. Um, Jason Tatum kind of disappeared in the second half. Jalen Brown was, uh, he's put up a good counting stats, but I thought he was awful. I mean, I thought he was arguably the worst player on the court. Grant Williams wasn't that good. Um, Derek White was dreadful. Um, and, uh, and you know, again, the, the, the big thing to me, Sep, again, is that the Celtics played the exact game that he wanted, and you can't win that way. And then on the offensive end, they only scored 45 points in the second half, and it felt like, Half of that came the second half of the fourth quarter when the game was kind of decided. That's when right. Jalen Brown put up his points because up until then he was a disaster, but then he hit a couple of off balance threes, went to the basket. He struggled at the free throw line. So he put up decent numbers. If you didn't watch the game, he'd say, well, he still scored what 23 points, but it was not a good night for Jalen Brown. Pritchard did nice things on offense, but he is just a liability on defense. You know, if you could have Pritchard on the offensive end and Derek white on the defensive end, you'd have yourself a really good player, but that's not, you know, allowed in the NBA, unfortunately. And again, you look at the Celtics in the first half, they were aggressive getting to the paint, getting to the rim. They were able to score 42 points in the paint in the first half, but only six in the second half. And again, when you get down and you're getting absolutely obliterated, now you just start chucking threes because that's how you're going to try to get back in the game. But again, the first half was a good performance for the Celtics, but at halftime, I just did not feel as confident because they should have had a bigger lead. Um, and, And again, Sometimes these games turn in the first half when you should be up at by 15 or 16 at the half and it's only eight and Miami can go into the locker room and say, look, we've got them because we're the best third quarter team so far in the playoffs jet in 12 games in the postseason, Miami's outscored their opposition by 102 points. That's eight and a half poor game in the third quarter alone. If you just play even for the other three quarters, Miami's going to win every game because they dominate the third quarter. That That's incredible, and I think that speaks to Eric Spolstra, who we both think is the best coach in the business right now, made the proper adjustments, and they sailed from there. Yeah, and so you can't – again, Miami knows that they're a really good third-quarter team, and they did what they wanted to do. And if you're the Celtics, you can't let Miami do everything they want to do. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Uh you know, we, we talked about the, the mental thing uh, a minute ago, Sep. Miami, I think, is as mentally strong team as it gets. And the Celtics have been mentally strong, but they, they kind of folded in this game. Um, and uh, and here's here's how I look at Miami. So they got somewhat of that uh, that early 2000s Pistons in them where, OK, mm-hmm. they have like a you know, they have a star ish, um, but they're more the sum of their parts. Um and they are well coached. You know, Larry Brown was the coach of that Pistons team. Say what you want about him. He's a very good coach. Great um, coach. And I think this is the, the biggest key, Sap. They're not going to make mistakes that cost them the game. It's not going to happen. <laughs> so if the Celtics, I think we both agree, Sap, are more talented on paper than, than Miami. But if another team plays pretty much mistake-free, and you're making a lot of mistakes, the team that's going to play mistake-free is going to win the game. So the Celtics can't be spotting the Heat all these errors because Miami is not going to give them back. You know, you have to be able to play a much more clean game than what the Celtics did. Um, Miami, you're, you're not going to force them into playing dumb basketball, and Miami forced the Celtics into the, in that third quarter, especially, of playing just really 
dumb basketball. And that was enough to, to swing the game um, in the Celtics' favor. And now the Celtics are in a position where, by my count, Sap, this will be their fourth must-win game of the postseason because I thought that game, uh, game two of the Milwaukee series was a must-win, as was obviously game six and game seven because they faced elimination. And so I, think that, I don't think the Celtics can go down two games and nothing to this Miami team and, and win the series. No, Philadelphia did, then they evened it up, and then Miami took control in games five and six. I think the Celtics will have more resolve than Philadelphia had in games five and six. I, I trust them more than I do the 76ers, but I, I agree with you. They need to win a game here in Miami at some point. I also don't think Miami's going to be intimidated coming into the garden. Jimmy Butler seems to play well in the postseason, whether it's home, away, a bubble, you know, on the playground, wherever you want to have that game, he's going to show up and compete. The other thing, too, is obviously we know the Celtics were shorthanded last night, but we can't just use that as an excuse because Kyle Lowry wasn't playing for Miami. and They seemed right. to handle without him. Now, Marcus Smart, who is kind of a poor man's version of Kyle Lowry, they're somewhat similar. So, OK, they cross each other off. Now you're losing Al Horford. But heck, Robert Williams, the third one, and I thought played pretty darn well for a guy who's been in and out of the lineup in the postseason. He got gassed early and he, you know, mishandled the ball near the rim a few times leading to Bam Adebayo or Jimmy Butler blocks among the 12 that Miami had. But I thought he played pretty well. Now, it appears that Smart will be back for game two, which will be helpful because you don't have to play Peyton Pitchard 30 minutes. And again, on the offensive end, he's fine. On the defensive end, he's a liability. But I don't think you're going to see Al Horford till game three. Again, we don't even know what the situation is with the health and safety protocol because who knows if he's vaccinated Maybe he's partially vaccinated. He's not boosted. I mean, there's a lot that we haven't learned. We can speculate, but that was a major blow two, two and a half hours before tip-off that you find out Al Offert's not available. Yeah, it's so frustrating. This is the third time this season he's been in healthy safety protocols, and you're like, okay, what the hell, Al? You know, we don't know what his vaccination status is. It was unclear at the end of the season. He says he's vaccinated, but the fact that he's gotten this now three times um, mm -hmm. it, it is certainly suspect and and – like, I, I, did he inject himself with water and said it was a vaccination? I don't know. Um, Who knows? But, but it, it's it's certainly frustrating, and, and they really missed him last night. I know Rob Williams played well, but um, the Al Horford, if you look, break down the numbers, he's been their second best player uh, from an analytical standpoint, Sep, when they're on and off the court. Obviously, Tatum's their best player. No, there's no debate about that. But in terms of impact um, this postseason – the Celtics have been so much better offensively and defensively when Al Horford is on the court. And so that's a, a big miss for the Celtics not having him. And we know Mark when Marcus Smart brings to the table. And and certainly I think Pritchard overall, though, even though he's not great defensively, I think that he he was he was certainly did his his job um in game one. Like I don't I don't think for you could ask, time I don't think you could ask for much more from the no. guy. Um no. so I, I think that you know that Derek White needs to step up a little bit more, but Marcus Smart certainly will, will help a lot too. And I think that he's, it just sounds weird to say about him based off his history, but this season he's been more of a calming presence. Um, and Al Horford, I think is that, and the Celtics in the third quarter needed that desperately and they couldn't find it anywhere. Um, and, and that's something that speaks to a little bit of, I think the inexperience of coach Udoka a little bit was unable to calm his team down. And uh, Jason Tatum is supposed to be the star of the team and he wasn't able to do it. So there's definitely that, that gap there with the Celtics a little bit. Um, but, but overall Sap, Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, with the smart injury, he plays really hard. He's bound to get hurt occasionally. He, he was there. He tried to give it a go. He was too sore it was a very physical series against Milwaukee, but I do, I think he's going to come back next game. The Horford injury. It's like, I mean, I, I don't want to blame the guy, but I'm so frustrated. Like, how can you let this happen three times? And how can you let it happen in the playoffs? Like just isolate yourself. This is the Eastern conference finals. I I'm, I'm frustrated with him. Well, the thing is he was at shoot around. He was there before the game. I mean, the, the announcement came, I believe three hours right around there before the tip. So, we hear he was feeling OK, so he got tested because he's not vaccinated or he's not fully vaccinated. I mean, the rules are so unclear. It's it, now you're very unclear. Yeah. It's like trying to translate Shakespeare, like you read it, I read it and we see two totally different things. And that's the frustrating part, because this is a guy who's perceived to be a veteran, right? A level headed guy. This is as close as he's been to getting to the finals. Right. I mean, I know 
he was here in 2018 when they lost game seven to LeBron and the Cavaliers. But I think the Celtics right now, or at least before the series started, considered the favorite in the series. They were never the favorite against Cleveland back in 2018. So this is as close as Al Horford is going to get to making to the finals. And to just put yourself and your teammates in that position is really, really immature. I mean, for a guy that is talked about as a leader. So I doubt we'll see him unless he has a miraculous recovery or, or they fake things and say, Oh, by the way, Al, wasn't really feeling good back uh, on Sunday. But then now you've got the whole thing is, well, why the hell did he play Sunday? Why was he not tested? Like who the hell knows what's going to go on? We saw Charlie McAvoy look like he was going to miss a game and somehow flew into you know, North Carolina and played in game five. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm surprised more teams don't try to fake this type of stuff to try to get the player out there. But the other thing is, too, you know, did he infect someone now? You know, we'll have to see. Right. The next I mean, couple- he's around all the team. There's some trainers who tested yeah. positive. Uh, yeah, it's not good. I saw his son was in the locker room after game seven, too, with him. Like, no, it's not a good situation. And, and, and the, it's it's from a fan perspective it's really frustrating because you're like okay this guy's supposed to be a leader and a veteran this is the third time in health and safety protocols you know he's costing the team at the worst time to cost the team uh so you know again it's like you said the rules are so fuzzy we don't know what his status is so it's hard to make a, a, a definitive statement or determination on it but you know it's certainly it's frustrating and it's also like you know you kind of wish that the NBA would from a Celtics perspective would just be like the NFL and just be like, yeah, we're just not going to test anybody anymore. Don't worry about it. Like it's the playoffs. Like, do we really want to see series determined by who's, who's, you know, got COVID and who doesn't have COVID if they're asymptomatic, you know, if Al Horford is sick as a dog, that's a different story. But if he's asymptomatic, you know, I don't know. Um, So, you know, there's, there's a lot of layers to it, but uh Right now, the Celtics need him, and he's not available. And I, I don't. I would be shocked if he plays in Game Two, and I would be slightly surprised if he plays in Game Three. I mean, that's the status right now. Is that I think that Game Four is the most likely time you see him, and who knows what the Celtics are facing at by then. And so I, I think if the Celtics end up losing this series, and Al Horford misses a, three games in it, I think there's going to be a lot of upset fans with Al Horford. Yeah, absolutely, and I would assume upset upset teammates. And management, yeah. et cetera. You know, we're hearing that Ime Adoka wasn't meeting with the press today. He wasn't feeling well, but it's non-COVID related. Who the hell knows? Um, so, you know, this is something that we're going to have to keep a close eye on. And now you get to game two and you got to kind of reverse this thing. You know, you can play with Miami. I thought you were in total control in the first half. And then in the third quarter was a total blitz by the heat. And that was pretty much it. And the funniest thing I was reading on Twitter throughout the game or right after the game was, well, the Celtics won three quarters. Well, the problem is the quarter that you lost, you lost 39 to 15. (laughs) And unfortunately this isn't tennis where you win, you know, three sets, lose a set, six love, and you win the match. They kind of carry those points into a total. So winning three quarters is, is really nice. But when you lose the one quarter, you lose by 25 points you generally lose that game. I, you know, I was having flashbacks because I'm I'm the old guy that has to go back to the eighties all the time. The Celtics were playing the Atlanta Hawks in game five of the second round of the playoffs in 1986. That was the great 85, 86 Celtics team, which lost exactly one home game throughout the regular Mm. season and postseason. And it was a close game at the half and the Celtics outscored Atlanta 35 to five in the third quarter. So it it was even um, pretty similar to what happened last night, except even more of a overpowering performance by the Celtics, but that was the 86 Celtics who looked like they could do that on any given night. If they just had their focus for 12 minutes, they could run those type of quarters off and Atlanta's back in 86, not quite as good as the Celtics team. So that wasn't a huge surprise. 35 to five run is, is unheard of in the NBA. You see it now because one team misses their threes, the other team hits their threes, and all of a sudden it's a blowout. We seem to see it the entire game when Dallas beat Phoenix in game seven. But yeah. last night, like this is a competitive game. This is going to be a competitive series. And in the third quarter, just like one team showed up to play and the other one didn't. Yeah, they quit. The Celtics absolutely quit in the yeah. third quarter, uh, uh, without a doubt. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're, they're left facing a, a difficult task into having to now – beat Miami in Miami, something that no team has done this postseason. Um, the Heat are undefeated at home. Um, I, and I agree with you. Celtics certainly should. They can play with Miami. I don't think that Miami is this daunting, you know, team that's like, oh, my God, how are we going to figure this out? 
Um, but you have to you have to clean up the things that you did wrong, and and you can't <laughs> allow a team to go on that, that sort of massive type of run. You can't turn the ball over every possession. Um, you, you can't just let Miami dictate how the entire you know second half of the game is going to be played. And that's exactly what happened. So the Celtics have a lot to, to figure out, but it's all stuff. It's nothing that's, you know, particularly like, oh, well, what do they do here? It's so it's, it's pretty clear stuff. Um, so I, I think they, they're fully capable of doing it, um, but they need to play a lot more mistake-free basketball and they need to show a little bit more mental toughness. Um, and you know that Miami is going to show the mental toughness night in and night out. You need to match that. Um, it, it, and so that's on the Celtics to figure it out. They, they have a, you know, this series is, there's no large lulls. There's just a day between every game. And so they have to quickly fix it. I hear a lot of people saying, Oh, well, the Celtics are physically and mentally fatigued from that Milwaukee series. Well, that's not to me, that's not an excuse. You know, this is, this is how it goes. Teams get tired in the postseason. You played a lot of games at this point, Miami's Miami played six. I know it wasn't as physical as in Milwaukee, but they played six games against uh, Philadelphia I'm sure they're tired too. Um, mm-hmm. you, you can't you can't point that and say, okay, well, uh, Celtics are physically and mentally tired from Milwaukee. They they you know they give them a little bit of a break. No, it's, it's it's Eastern Conference Finals. They can't be able to figure out how to overcome mental and physical exhaustion. That's not an excuse. That's just that's a failure in my, in my mind. That's a big part of the test. And again, they came out looking good in the first half. Got that 13 point lead, led by eight at the half. So you know after a break at halftime they came out and played god-awful basketball and the other team played near perfect basketball and jimmy butler by the way it's nearly a perfect game he tossed last night right when you really look at the numbers 41 points 12 of 19 from the floor that's better than 60 percent 17 of 18 from the free throw line 0 for 2 from three and again he's kind of a unique player in the nba today doesn't really jack up many threes but then he gives you nine rebounds and five assists and four steals and three blocks and man if i was back into fantasy basketball i'd I'd draft jimmy butler pretty high because he stuffs the stat sheet but again quick turnaround here we'll see what happens i expect smart to be back i would be shocked if Horford plays because you know if he does you'd have to look and say well someone's cooking the books here or or blatantly lying because you don't as positive and come yeah, back, which I have no time. problem with. Is no, thing. I mean, let know, him right our back is probably up in heaven saying, You got to do what you got to do, you know, right, the ends exactly. justify the needs. No problem at I'm all. Sure, I'm sure Pat, sure Riley, Pat Riley, yeah, thing. Pat Riley thinks well, the same, thinks thing. same thing. <laughs> and I know you hate Pat Riley, and Pat Riley hates the Celtics more than any other franchise in basketball. And you know, I was watching the game last night, and I'm looking at the Miami team, and just a quick history lesson. Um, Riley won the title with the Lakers in his very first year, actually. Uh, they fired Paul Westhead early in the season with the Pat Riley. They won the title in 82. The next year they got swept by Philadelphia. They were just trampled by Moses Malone. The next year they played the Celtics. They were actually the favorite. The Celtics did have home court advantage. It was still for my money, the most intense NBA finals I've ever seen Celtics win in seven games, but through four games, you just felt like the Lakers should have already swept them. They gave away game two. They gave away game four. That's when, you know, McHale clothesline, Kurt Rambis. Uh, Magic Johnson had an awful final series. I know no, ever, no one ever thinks Magic Johnson had a bad playoff, but he had a bad series in 84. And I think from that point forward, after losing that series, Pat Riley put it in his head that we are never going to be intimidated again, whether he was coaching the Lakers, the Knicks, the Heat, running the Heat. He, he's constantly built these teams that feel almost like football teams, right? Even remember the Heat in the 2000s. They, they were the physical team in the league. And before that, it was the Knicks. That's how he constructs these teams. And and with him, I think it's as much, not just talent, but it's makeup. You see a player like PJ Tucker who turned his ankle. And I think 95% of NBA players would not have come out for the second half, but that guy's a warrior. He's a veteran. He came out. And I think that was inspirational. I know Stan Van Gundy mentioned that. And I thought that was a great point by Van Gundy. Yeah. Um, it, it's uh, it, they're, they're very, very, very well-constructed team. They have a lot of veterans. They have a lot of, uh, you know, guys who, who know how to be mentally tough and are physically tough too. Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very good team um, without a doubt. It's just not the traditional team that you see usually this deep in the postseason, at least in recent history, that's, you know, star laden. Uh, they're not, but, mm-hmm. uh, but they're, they're, vis- they're tough. Um, and we always, we said during the whole season, they're going to be a tough out in the postseason. 
thus far, no one's figured out how to knock them out. So that's on, it's on the Celtics to figure that out. And uh, we will see if they're able to do that in game two, but Sap, uh, before the game last night, there was another uh, event. It was the NBA draft lottery um, and uh, the Orlando magic for, I believe it is the fourth time in franchise history won the lottery. So they are very adept at doing that. The three times prior, it was Shaquille O'Neal, Penny Hardaway, um, and Dwight, Dwight Howard. Howard. Yep. The, Dwight the, Howard. the Penny Hardaway is not actually accurate. I know oh yeah, it was Chris that. Weber. Right, Chris it was Weber. Chris Weber. Then they traded him. So right. I mean, for, imagine they traded him, him for Penny Hardaway. Right. Yeah, they, they won the lottery in '92. Obviously, they took Shaq. That was a no-brainer. Then in '93, they took Weber, but then traded him for Hardaway. And imagine if they had, well, Hardaway and Shaq looked like they were building something, but then the injuries caught up to Hardaway. And then before you knew it, Shaq was on his way to L.A. Left left after four years. I mean, you know, the rules were a little bit different, opened up for the Lakers to to get him. But uh, imagine a front quarter Weber and Shaq. That would have been interesting to see. And again, they met in a famous 2002 conference finals when Sacramento probably had the better team, but the Lakers found a way to win. And then, yeah, Dwight Howard. Well, you know, found the, a way to win, had, you know, the refs fix it, whatever sure, yeah, you want to call it. It does help. Yeah, it does help. And Robert Ory always hitting big shots, right? Um, but, yeah, now they've got the first pick. And, again, I, you know more about this stuff. You watch a lot more college basketball than I do. I mean, if you're running the Orlando Magic, who are you taking with that first pick? Oh, man. Um you know, it, it's, it's really, it seems like it's a toss up between um, Jabari Smith from Auburn um, and uh, Chet Holmgren from Gonzaga. I, I think, you know, the magic need to work those two guys out and figure out whatever, they, whoever they think is the, has the highest ceiling. Um, Cause it's not like they're picking for need at this point. Like they just need to pick the best player available. Um, I, I like what they have in Orlando at, center though so they have um wendell carter who they and mo bamba so they're pretty good there so i don't necessarily think that home even though like i'm saying pick the best player available i would think they probably shade towards jabari um Mm -hmm. because he has a very very high ceiling he might have the highest ceiling in the draft and then they don't have to figure out how to you know then trade you know if they if they take home green which they very well might They'd have to trade either Carter or Bamba. Um, and then, you know, that's another that who do they want to get for that? So I feel like right now they probably would lean towards that. But again, they're in a position where they have to draft whoever they think is the best player. So it doesn't matter that they have two centers. They think Holmgren is going to be the best player. They draft Holmgren. Um, the, the rest of the lottery, uh, at least, you know, uh, uh, the, the top, you know, 10, uh, the Magic have the first pick, then the Thunder, then the Rockets, Kings, Pistons, Pacers, Blazers, the Pelicans get the Lakers pick at number eight, Spurs and Wizards. Um, and uh, then I'll just finish it off. Why did I limit myself to 10? Uh, Knicks at 11, Thunder get the Clippers pick at 12, the Hornets are at 13, and the Cavs are at 14. Um, so not a ton of surprises. No one really, the Kings jumped up a little bit, but they were bad this year. So uh, I, I here's what I think is going to happen with the Kings, Sap. They're going to draft a really good player. And it's not going to make a difference for them. They're going to either trade him or let him go at some point in time. The Kings are good at drafting, uh, except for the, the the Marvin Bagley pick, which is going to turn out to be historically bad. Not because Bagley is a bad player, but because they passed on Luka Doncic and to a lesser extent, Trey Young. Um, but, you know, all the other guys, you know, Halliburton, um, Fox, Cousins back in the day, they've done a good job drafting. They just, they, don't get the most out of it. And then they end up having souring with their relationship with them. So they, it doesn't matter where the Kings do their, their cluster leap um, for the thunder and the rockets. They're just in talent accumulation mode, right? They're both in complete rebuilding. They're happy to be in this, you know, that high in the lottery. I think this, there's not a clear cut one in this draft. So, you know, being in the top three, four, five, I think everybody feels pretty good about where they are. So if I'm the thunder and the rockets, I'm just continuing to just add, players that I think are going to be good players because they're not going to be competitive in the next two, three years in my mind. The thing about Holmgren, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, right? Because, I mean, he, he looks like a unique player. But if he's Kristaps Porzingis and has some injury concerns, do you really take him at number one? He's also 20 and a half years old. I mean, he's he's a year to a year and a half older than some of these other players. He can't seem to put weight on, which is something I know nothing about. But, like, he is a guy who could really be such a unique player, go out and be a 
17, 18 point, 10, 11 rebound guy with a lot of blocks, ability to handle the ball, shoot threes. And you're like, we've got to take him." But he also could be this guy that's just so frail looking. And can he put weight on and, and you know, have to deal with, with some of the players you deal with in the NBA? The player I like, and it's more than just as a player, but Paolo Banchero from Oh, yeah, Duke. that's your guy. It's your Paisan. That's my guy. Well, because he has, you know, dual citizenship, the United States and Italy, and he already has an NBA body, right? 6'10", yeah. 250. I thought he had a but good tournament, too. He had a good tournament. Yeah, he's. A, I mean, he's a good player. Um, Jabari Smith Jr. looks like the most ready-made guy, and it seems like his game will translate to the NBA because he's a 6'9", 6'10", guy with a big wingspan who can also shoot threes. So, you know, maybe he's that guy. And then Jordan Ivey's the guard from Purdue. Those will probably be the top four picks, I guess. Um, yeah. I don't think it looks as good as the top four of last year's draft. I think all four of those guys that went one, two, three, four last year are going to be stars, right? I mean, Kate Cunningham, Mobley with Cleveland, um, Green with Houston, and this rookie Bar- there was Scott Barnes. Barnes. Those four guys all look like legitimate studs. Like, I'm not going to say superstars, but I think all four of those guys at some point will make an all-star team. Um, yeah, they all they look at – well, I was, saying, you know, I was talking to this uh, with my dad last night uh, when, as we were watching the game and, you know, the lottery – and he was asking me because he knows I he doesn't really watch college basketball, you know, what I thought of the draft. And then my honest assessment is there's not going to be any more weak drafts. Uh, you know, that's a thing of the past in my mind. Um, there's just too much talent coming internationally. There's a lot less kids playing football um, mm-hmm. and, and switching to basketball. So that that, you know, that time when he was like, oh, this, you know, look at like that what was it, the 2000 draft with like Kenyon Martin and stuff mm-hmm. like that. And the that's not that's not happening anymore where you're like oh this is kind of a weak draft i think every draft from here on forward is going to be a a pretty strong draft there will be some stra- drafts that are stronger than others but i just think every draft is going to have multiple it's going to be littered with multiple all-star caliber players going forward cuz the nba is just going to keep getting more and more talent as the game continues to grow rapidly internationally as less kids in the united states play football because of the concussion concerns and switch to basketball that's uh, that that's uh, going to be the case, and I think this year, yeah, maybe it's not as quite as sexy at the top, but I, I can promise you, Sap, there's going to be multiple all stars in this draft because that's the way that it's going with the draft. It, it just you're going to find guys who are undrafted who are going to be important players, um, and uh, this year I don't think will be any different. We we saw you know who have been the past four MVPs. Giannis uh, was you know the 15th pick. Um, Jokic was a second round pick. You're going to mm-hmm. be able to find guys. Yeah, I mean, and again, you got so much talent coming from overseas, right? So not only the one and dones here in the States, but then a bunch of players that already play in professional leagues. And you see that with Luka Doncic. When he came here, he felt like a man already. Like he'd always played against older guys and, and that type of competition. So should be interesting to see what happens here um, as we get closer to the draft. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the combine is starts right away. Um, I think it's it's late. It's tomorrow, maybe. Um, in Chicago, so they they you know don't waste any time. Um, but uh, for our two teams, Sap, the Celtics and the Lakers, a non-factor in the lottery. The Lakers should have been a factor, Sap, but uh, the Anthony Davis trade uh, yielded another pick for the Pelicans. Uh, is that is that something that bothers you, or are you just kind of the price of doing? Big? I lost Sap. I don't know what happened to him. But we we're gonna wrap it up anyways. So I'm gonna say this. That's going to do it for us here at the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Chet and Sap. Uh, we're presented by Full Press Coverage. We're going to be back all postseason long doing plenty of stuff. Um, we'll react to the the Warriors game that's tonight. We'll react to that later in the week. Um, and we'll talk more about the Celtics and the Heat going forward. Uh, any other storylines that crop up, obviously. So make sure you type in the Pick and Roll NBA podcast with Jet and Sap um, to... Anywhere podcasts are found, find our social medias at JohnSap25 at Jet Stryer. And we will talk to you later, everybody. Thanks for watching. See ya.